Life Springs. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see all of you with us today. You know, we've been in this series for eight weeks now. And so for the past seven weeks, you've been hearing the call to Christian service. And as I conclude this series today, I, I, wanna, I want you to hear the whole truth and nothing but the truth. So truth in advertising here, I got to tell you, there is a downside Sometimes serving is demanding and difficult and requires tremendous sacrifice on your part. Sometimes it seems like there are long, dry spells between when you were sowing seeds and when the harvest eventually comes. Often your sacrifice and good deeds may feel underappreciated, may even go unnoticed. And sometimes there will be criticism, harsh and painful criticism. Sometimes there can even be conflict. And when things get tough, it's normal to ask, is it worth it? Is it worth it? If you've ever served somewhere in the church and wondered, is it worth it? Then today, this message is for you. In Matthew chapter 19, beginning at verse 27, Peter essentially was asking that same question. He said, to Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What will there be for us? Is it worth it? Will it be worth all the sacrifices we've made? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father and mother or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. Jesus is saying, your sacrifices for the kingdom of God will never go unnoticed. And you'll never be able to outgive or out-sacrifice God. He rewards a hundred times as much for our sacrifice in his service. Additionally, I want to share with you this morning that there are eight rewards for Christian service. Seven of which that you're going to be able to experience right now in the here and now in this life. And an eighth and, and one more that you'll have to wait till heaven or till the return of Jesus. So if you have your program, pull out that white sheet and it has notes that go along with this today's message and, and I'll help you fill in some of those blanks. The tan sheet for those who are guests, the tan sheet is a life group lesson that corresponds with this message. It's what our groups, small groups will be studying this week. So pull out the white sheet and follow along. The first reward for a life of service to Christ is that you're going to experience a deeper appreciation for God's amazing work in his church. In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It stands to reason that when you're involved in the ministry of Jesus' victorious church, you're going to get more out of church You're going to get more out of your church family. You're going to have a greater church life experience than those who just attend Sunday services because you're going to appreciate the church all the more because of what you're putting into it. You're going to get more out of it. The church is not the building, friends. The church is not the paid staff. The church is not the service here on Sunday morning. The church is the people and you are the church. The longer you serve in Jesus victorious church, the more you're going to be exposed to a variety of different people whom by God's wisdom and design has created with different spiritual gifts and different spiritual passions. Now, once you get past that attitude of why doesn't everybody care about this ministry as intensely as I care about it, and why doesn't everyone do their ministry the way I go about my ministry? In other words, why isn't everyone in the church normal like me? Once you get past those kind of immature perspectives, you're going to grow in appreciation for the marvelous diversity in the body of Christ. When you see the body of Christ functioning like it was designed, like it was supposed to function with the diversity of people experiencing their, uh, expressing their spiritual gifts, you're just going to have this huge overflowing appreciation for the wisdom of God's design of his church. If you haven't noticed, people in church are very different. Can I get an Amen. 
Yeah, you must look around. We're, we're different ages, different generations, di- di- different uh, ethnic backgrounds, uh, different social economic backgrounds, uh, different taste in clothing. Well, we're just all kinds of different. And yet, in spite of all of our differences, God blends the unique contribution of every single one in the church into one beautiful body that carries out his work. In in this series, we've talked about at least 26 different spiritual gifts. And God, the fact that God gives every believer at least one gift. But to many people, he gives multiple gifts. We, We might... Uh, think of them in turn as a gift mix. We're a mixture of a few different gifts. This means that in the church, there are not just 26 different kinds of believers. There's really no limit to the diversity. God gives a mixture of, or a combination of gifts to people that result in every gift being flavored or enhanced by the other gifts that go along with it. So really there's unlimited diversity in the body of Christ. Let me help you understand what I'm saying by just illustrating this with, for, just for one uh, illustration, is the gift of intercessory prayer. You combine the gift of intercession with administration and you have someone who loves to pray through list and is very organized and detailed about tracking prayer requests and God's answers. Combine the gift of intercession with mercy and you have someone who loves more than anything else to pray for the sick and the hurting and the needy. Combine intercession with evangelism and you have someone who wants to focus on praying for the loss, for the outreach of the church, for missionaries all over the world. You combine the gift of intercession with someone who has the gift of discernment of spirits. And you have someone who wants to pray spiritual warfare prayers boldly to help individuals and even whole churches be delivered from spiritual bondage. Combine intercession with the gift of prophecy. And you have someone who wants to be focused on revival taking place in the lives of people. Revival taking place in the life of of a church. Or revival taking place in the nation. Or God's judgment coming upon the enemies of godliness in the world. Combine intercession with the gift of teaching. And you have someone who wants to focus prayer on the hearts of people being open and receptive to the teaching of God's word. And you want, they want to see believers grow to be strong and rooted and grounded in the word of God. Friends, this is just a sample of the diversity in the expression of just one gift when it's combined with other gifts. Add to that all the possible gift combinations, and then you'll have different spiritual passions with those different combinations, and we'll just marvel at God's multifaceted design of his church. And the longer you're serving Over time, as you mature in your serving, you're just going to grow a greater appreciation for God's work and the wisdom of God's design for his church. In fact, the church, the Bible tells us, is going to be be the vehicle to put the wisdom of God on display to the entire spiritual realm. That's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3. He says his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, we're the vehicle, we're the giant billboard in the spiritual realm to, to declare the wisdom of God to the forces of evil. God's wisdom is on display in us, in his church. The second reward for a life of Christian service is that you're going to experience the camaraderie of serving in like-minded community. Now, next week, we're kicking off a study of the book of Philippians, and Pastor Kevin is going to be here uh, to, to give us a report about the distribution of those 950 backpacks to the kids in Africa, having just returned yesterday uh, afternoon. And he'll be here to preach and kick off this series. So I won't take the time to dive deeply into this passage, but I just want to read it to you this morning. And I want you to see the richness of Paul's relationships with the people in just this one church, the church in Philippi. 
Paul says in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 3, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began the good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Now listen, listen to verse 7. It is right for me to feel about this way about all of you since I have you in my heart. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And he he just, deep, fulfilling, meaningful relationships with his brothers and sisters in this church. Now at Life Springs, we believe in a team approach to ministry. We want to encourage people to do ministry in teams together. Because what we've said all through the series, we're better together. So whether it's teaching a kid's class or leading a small group or helping in many areas behind the scenes, we always think it's wise to develop a, a team that's accomplishing ministry together. Everyone needs to serve with at least one partner, but it's better yet when people are serving together as a team. And when you do over time, I'm telling you, there's going to be this big emotional and relational payoff. When you are involved in a ministry, you're going to develop some friends. And those friends could, over the course of time, be some of the most significant friendships of your entire life because you serve together. I did a study of of the New Testament expression that the Apostle Paul uses where he says, fellow worker. And what I learned is that the Apostle Paul was rich in meaningful relationships because of the fellow workers as a result of doing ministry alongside of others. And as I read these passages, listen to this close relational bond of love that Paul has with his fellow workers. Beginning in the book of Romans, chapter 16, verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful for them. 2 Corinthians 7, 6, but God comforts the downcast, comforting us by the coming of Titus. And you skip over a little later and he says, as for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. In Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 25, but I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom I sent to you to take, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him. And not only him, but also on me to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Colossians 4, Paul writes of Tychius. Tychius will tell you all the news about me. He is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and here's that word, and fellow servant in the Lord. I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts. In Colossians 4, verse 10, my fellow worker Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. You've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Jesus, who is called Justice, also sends greetings. These are the only Jews among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have proved a comfort to me. You see, as a result of serving alongside others in ministry, Paul experienced this close-knit camaraderie of such genuine Christian friends that he has developed friendships with people who will risk their lives for him, friends whom God would use over and over to bring him comfort, friends who would take care of his needs when he was unable to care for himself. They were co-workers who became his cherished friends and invaluable partners and his dearest brothers. The third reward for Christian service is that you're going to experience the joy of making a contribution to the spiritual growth of others. Friends, as I said in the opening, there are, there are heartaches in serving God. There are disappointments. There may sometimes even be betrayals. But there are also times when you see that someone that you've ministered to, their faith begins to take off. 
And they kind of get their spiritual feet underneath them and they begin to grow and then they begin to serve and impact others. And you watch that person that you've developed now serving and making an impact on other people's lives. And friends, it's just a sheer joy to see that. First Thessalonians 3 verse 7 and 8 says, For now we really live since we hear you are standing firm in the Lord. In 3 John, verse 3 and 4, John says, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children in the faith are walking in the truth. You're just going to be thrilled when you get to see someone that you've helped pour your life into then become someone who pours their life into others. A fourth reward for service. You're going to experience the fulfillment of knowing God has utilized you to accomplish his work. When Jesus sent out the 12 in Matthew 10, it was the first time that they were sort of on their own to do ministry as Jesus representatives. And here's what he promised them beginning in verse 17. He said, be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to the local councils and flog you in their synagogues. That wasn't the promise you were expecting, was it? On my account, you will be brought for governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you'll be given what to say, for you will not be speaking, but the spirit of your father will be speaking through you. Now, let me hasten to say, I don't believe that any of us have been promised the degree of inspiration that Jesus promised the 12 apostles. But I do know that when you step out and to speak for God and serve God, there will be times when you will get in way over your head. And it will happen just like it happened for the disciples according to Jesus' predictions in Matthew 10. At that time, you'll be given what to say. For it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Some of you have experienced that and you know it when it happens. And your first reaction is, wow, where did that come from? And you realize it's the Holy Spirit. Once you get over the shock and amazement, you have time to reflect back on God's incredible expression of grace in that time of ministry. And you realize the God of the universe was using you as his hands and as his mouthpiece. And when you realize that, there just comes this incredible sense of fulfillment. That your life matters because God is using you. He literally spoke through you and worked through you. When you realize that your life is useful in the work of God's eternal kingdom, there's no greater sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment in life. Ephesians 2.10 says we are God's workmanship. You could translate that. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Now, I want to hasten to say, we are not at all saved by our works, but we are saved for the purpose of performing good works. So, There's an incredible sense of meaning and purpose and fulfillment when we are carrying out the God-designed ministry within us because we're his masterpiece prepared for humble service to his glory. It's fulfilling. Number five, when you step up as a servant of God, and are involved in ministry, over time you're going to experience the infusion of a more powerful fuel energizing your life. This past week in our small groups, we we talked about spiritual passion. That's that emotional magnet that draws you to a specific kind of ministry. When you are serving in your area of passion, you will find out that that Christian service energizes the rest of your life. Instead of wearing you out, it gives you a higher octane fuel than all the other chores and responsibilities are are fueled by the leftovers of the charge you got out of doing that service. Instead of wearing you out, it gives you a higher octane fuel for all the other chores and responsibilities in your life. Serving your area of spiritual passion actually lightens your load rather than weighing you down because it energizes you. 
And I believe that's what Paul was referring to. When he wrote in Colossians 1, 29, he says, I labor struggling with all his energy, which he so powerfully works in me. The Holy Spirit energizes you for service. And then you're going to experience the thrill of contributing to a lost person's journey to faith in Jesus. When as a result of your commitment to servanthood and expression of your spiritual gifts in ministry, you influence someone to cross the line of faith and they say yes to Jesus and they, they say yes to that offer of salvation and they make Jesus their Lord and Savior, that's absolutely thrilling. Friends, one, one of the highlights of my life as a father was being in the baptistry with my own three children, Luke, Angela, and John, and baptizing each one of them as they came to faith in Christ. Thrilling experience. But there's something that's even more invigorating, more exciting, even more meaningful to me. That was when I was in the baptistry with my daughter. And together, the two of us were baptizing someone that she had led to Christ. Oh, that was just even more thrilling. Listen to Paul express the thrill he is feeling over the people he led to faith in Christ. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, he says, What is our hope, our joy, or, or the crown in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? It is you. He's writing to the people of this Thessalonian church. It is you. You are our glory and our joy. Now, you may not have the gift of evangelism that the apostle Paul had, but no matter what your gift is, God can use you to lead someone to Christ. There are teachers who just have helpful ways of explaining the gospel, helping people to understand it and come to faith. There are confrontational prophets that God uses in evangelism because there are some people who respond best to that direct approach. There are exhorters whom God uses to challenge people to take baby steps of faith that leads them to make the ultimate decision to trust their entire eternity to Christ as their Savior and Lord. There are those with the gift of service who in their humble, faithful ways of serving people and meeting practical needs win the hearts of people and they become effective evangelists then there are people with gifts of hospitality that can god can use to reach lost person because of their loving kindness that they show in welcoming them and accepting them friends when we are all using our gifts together it's like the whole church can be this one giant evangelistic team. And there's no greater thrill when we have a part in the story of someone's journey to faith. A seventh reward for serving the Lord. This one is going to come when you see Jesus. You'll experience the elation of hearing God's well done. Matthew twenty five twenty three. his master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Like a whole lot of boys who grew up in Oklahoma, I played football in high school. And seeing the coach on the sideline cheering me on just so motivated me. I mean, it, it, his enthusiastic clapping, boy, way to go, Roger, boy." I love that. Go get him. Good hit. Love that. Just looking over the sideline, seeing him cheer me on. It meant so much. It was so encouraging to hear. And yet high school football was just only a three short year part of my growing up. I've been serving Jesus my whole life, practically. I've been serving him in ministry for 46 years. I can't imagine the joy of seeing him face to face after 46, 50 plus years someday of service and hearing him say, well done. Well done, Roger. I mean, he's the one I've devoted my life to 
And when I hear his well done, I, I can't imagine the joy, the sense of encouragement that that will be. And friends, you can hear that too. But remember, the those that receive the well done commendation from Jesus are those who are the good and faithful servants. Servants. And last this morning, number eight, one of the rewards that you'll have if you get involved in ministry is that you'll experience a more confident assurance and anticipation of our eternal reward. As I said in the very outset of this message, there are hard times. There are disappointments. There are frustrations. There will be criticism. And sometimes the only thing that keeps a servant of God serving is hope. You see, friends, our serving is really an investment in heaven. Much of the time, our labors are not going to be seen in this life. We keep serving because we believe that ultimately there's going to be be fruit and reward for our faithful service. So hope gets built up as you serve Jesus. Hope in your eternal reward and because of the promises of Jesus himself. God knows we need hope to keep going. That's why he tells us so much in the scriptures about heaven. For example, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, the apostle Paul, as he's approaching the end of his life, he says, now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but to all those who long for his appearing. A crown of righteousness. There's reward in his future. When he sees Jesus. When I think of someone who was able to help a whole nation have hope, I think of Winston Churchill and the hope he gave to Great Britain in the dark days of World War II. Richard Foster, in his book, The Celebration of Discipline, writes about the discipline of service. And he tells of a time when Churchill came alongside a discouraged group of citizens. And he built them up and pumped them up with encouragement that that they needed. You see, during World War II, England desperately needed to increase its production of coal. Coal not only kept Britain's people warm in the winter, but it also powered British industry and railways and shipping. And after the loss of the French and Belgian coal fields to the German occupation, Britain's coal was all the more important to the war effort. Winston Churchill called together the labor leaders to enlist their support. At the end of his presentation, he asked them to picture in their minds a parade that would take place in the future. One day, a parade that would be held in Piccadilly Circus after the war. First, he said, would come in that parade the sailors who had kept the vital sea lanes open. And they would be honored. And then would come the soldiers who had come home from Dunkirk and then gone on to defeat Rommel in Africa. And then would come the pilots who had driven the Luftwaffe off from the sky. And the last of all, he said, would come a long line of sweat-stained, soot-streaked men in miners' caps. And someone from the crowd would cry, And where were you during the critical days of our struggle? And from 10,000 throats would come the answer, we were deep in the earth with our faces to the coal. You see what he was doing here? He was helping them envision their essential role in the ultimate allied victory. Now, friends, not all the jobs in the church are prominent and glamorous. Not all are on stage or in the spotlight. Not all receive applause. But it is often the servant-minded people with their faces to the coal who are working behind the scenes and out of sight many times to help the church accomplish its mission. And there will be a parade in heaven someday for all of God's servants. And if there is a a parade for and of the servants of Life Springs Christian Church, the real heroes are are not going to be the pastors or the staff, or even the elders. 
but all the servants who are behind the scenes quietly and faithfully helping the church to accomplish its God-given mission. And one day we'll all stand before Jesus, our ultimate rewarder, and hear him say, well done. Regarding that day, Jesus himself gave us this promise in Revelation 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. He said, behold, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me and I will give to each one, everyone, according to what he has done. One day, friends, you're going to stand before our heavenly rewarder. You're going to want to hear his well done. And you're going to receive your eternal reward. So serve. Serve. Serve the Lord with all your heart. And know for sure, it will be worth it. Would you stand with me for closing prayer?